And we are going to analyze quadratic functions today. Okay, there you go. And we're going to work with this function first. Yes, we are, right there. 7x squared minus 5x plus 5. Let us graph this, just so you can take a look at it. Have a mental image, that always helps. So y equals, 7x squared minus 5x plus 5. And we're going to graph. All right, let's kind of hone in on there. Um, how about negative 5, 5. That's better. OK, this is our graph. 7x squared minus 5x plus 5. Make sure I did that right. 7x squared minus 5x plus 5. OK. Here we go. First thing you look at when you're analyzing a quadratic function, is it cupped up or is it cupped down? Well, you can look at the graph. You're kidding me. You can look at the graph. All right, one more time, 7x squared minus 5x plus 5. All right, there it is. And I don't know. Should I? Yeah, negative 5. 5, go through the whole process again. Of course, I know that some of you just are, have no idea how to use your graphing calculators, and a lot of you do know how. So, how do we even the playing field? Here's how. There are rules on this sheet, lots of rules and lots of formulas. This is cupped up, you saw that from the graph. It looks like that. Cupped up like a cup of coffee. But how else would you know that? Well, it's cupped up if the A number is greater than zero. The A number is seven. Seven is definitely greater than zero. So you would know immediately just from looking at the graph that this is a cupped up parabola. If that number, the A number, the leading coefficient is negative, less than zero, then you have a cupped down parabola. But this one is cupped up. So I'm going to circle cupped up. Okay, the second question. <clears throat> why intercept? There's a quicker way and a slower way, but there is a rule and that rule is always that you let all the x's equal zero and whatever number is left over is your y-intercept. So if you let that x equal zero 
and that X equals zero, then these terms zero out and you're left with a five. So if you let your X's equal zero, you're left with a five, and that's the Y number. So the way you write that as an ordered pair is zero for X equals zero, and five for Y equals five. It's also the number on the end. That's the quick way. Is it always going to be the y-intercept? As long as you've got a function, it is. Okay. Now we're going to find the, the zeros of a function, of this function. The zeros are the numbers, the number you put in for x that makes f of x equals zero. That's the technical meaning. It's why they're called zeros. So, because that's what a zero is, we let f of x equal zero, and we say zero equals seven x squared minus five x plus and then you can factor it if it's factorable. And this one isn't. I have insider information. But you could try. You'd say 7 times 5 is 35. How can I find two numbers that multiply to 35 and add to negative 5? And you can work on that. But I promise you, it's not factorable using the methods we've learned. So we're going to use the quadratic formula without my uh, singing to you. So you have something to be grateful for. All right, so let's make a list here. A is seven. B is negative five, and C is five, positive five. Now let me pull this out so it looks like a five. Okay, now X equals negative B, and B is negative five, plus or minus the square root of parentheses negative five. Negative numbers always go in parentheses because you know you're going to do this on your calculator and you don't want to get the wrong answer. So always put a negative number in parentheses. Negative five squared minus four times A, which is seven, times C, which is five. Over two A, which is two times seven. Okay, so this is going to equal negative negative five, that's a five, plus or minus the square root Excuse me. I had birds stealing the cat's food. That's something you don't do. I leave food outside for the stray cats. That's war, you know. It also makes them easy for the cats to get to. Here we go, negative five squared is 25. 
Minus four times seven is 28 times five. Hmm, what could that be? Let's get the calculator. Move it over. All right, uh, four times seven times five, or minus four, well, negative four times seven times five is minus 140, oh my goodness. Over 14, two times seven. Now, could I have just done the whole thing in print in uh, on the calculator? Yes, here's how. Parentheses, negative five, parentheses closed, closed, squared, minus four, times seven times five is negative one, one, five. Which is what we get if we said 25 minus 140. So five plus or minus the square root of negative one, one, five. Oops, a negative under the square root. That means we're in the complex number system. Okay, kind of come over here and make a note. The square root of negative 115 is the square root of negative one times positive 115, which is the square root of negative one. Oh, I don't want to do that. which is the square root of negative one times the square root of 115, which is I times the square root of, now I want to check out 115. So 115 divided by five. No, that's not a perfect square. And that's not a perfect square. 5 times 23 is 115. Okay, so I don't need to worry about breaking breaking this down, simplifying the radical. I am just going to have 115 right here. So that's what I'm dealing with. Equals 5 plus or minus I, this isn't my final answer, 115 over 14. This is a complex number, complex, and has to be put in A plus B I form. And the way we do that, it's not hard. X equals five plus or minus, all right, five over 14, plus or minus the square root of 115 over 14, I. Now, I don't know if my math lab will take that, so let's come over here and make an answer box. It will be an answer box. 5 over 14 minus the square root of 115, 115 over 14 I. And then we put a comma between them and 5 over 14 plus the square root of 115 over 14 I. And that's probably the best thing to type in the answer box. However, you might try this first. See if my math lab will let you write that. Or 
All right, now, I should have written these up here, so I am going to use the plus or minus just to save room. Five, what, what, what? Five. Yes, five over 14 plus or minus the square root of 115 over 14 i. And I'll make a little box around that. These are our zeros. If I really wanted to suffer and I were to plug, say, 5 over 14 minus the square root of 115 over 14i in for each of these x's and work really hard, I would get zero. Okay, so these are the two zeros, but now we're going to categorize them. Whenever you get a negative number under your square root radical, so that you have to change this to an I number, you have complex conjugate solutions. They have names. Now, I want to go back to the graph and show you something. <clears throat> I can find it. Here it is. There. I knew the minute I looked at the graph that our answers would be complex conjugates. That's how I knew not to spend any time bothering to factor. Because whenever you have complex conjugate answers, solutions, actually um, um, zeros, whenever you have complex conjugate zeros, you don't have a parabola touching the x-axis. All right, there are no x-intercepts, for instance, because complex conjugate numbers or just complex numbers are not on the x-axis. The x-axis only has real numbers, numbers in the real number system, not complex numbers. So the fact that this doesn't get down to the x-axis means that I have complex conjugate zeros. Now, do I have one or two? Well, there are two there. That's what the plus or minus means. There's a minus answer and a plus answer, a minus zero and a plus zero. So there are two. We have two complex conjugate um, zeros. Also, there are no x-intercepts. That's important because if I skip an answer, if I skip five and go to six, notice that if these had been real numbers, which they're not, I would have typed one of the zeros here and then comma zero in parentheses and then uh, uh, put a comma after them, between them, and then in parentheses, the second zero, comma zero, and those would have been my x-intercepts, but there aren't any x-intercepts for the reasons I stated, but looking at the graph will tip, the, tip you off to that immediately. Graph doesn't touch the x-axis, no x-intercepts, only one kind, only one kind of zero prevents you from getting to the x-axis, and that's complex conjugate. But it doesn't tell you what the complex conjugate zeros are, so you still have to find them for yourself. Oh. 
OK. Now we can still write this in factored form. Because it has zeros. I can call this one zero one. And this one zero two. And then you have the formula written down here. All right, A is the leading coefficient. So here's how we're going to write this. F of, well, yeah, do it in black. F of X equals seven times X minus parentheses. So I guess I should have put brackets, but nah. five over 14 minus the square root of 115 over 14 I Close that parenthesis and that parenthesis. This one has to be closed. And this one has to be closed, the parentheses. Times X minus parentheses, five over 14, plus the square root of 115 over 14 times I. And I close that parenthesis and that parenthesis. And then we clean it up a little bit because that's always nice to do. I'm going to be distributing the minus sign there and there and distributing this minus sign there and there so that what I end up with is seven parentheses X minus five fourteenths plus the square root of 115 over 14 I X minus 5 over 14. Now minus times my times plus is minus. The square root of 115 115. Why am I saying 115 over 14 I? And this is your final answer. What is the value of doing this? Well, aside from the fact you're going to be asked to do it, um, it lets you know immediately what your zeros are. Namely, that your zeros are complex conjugates, so you're not going to waste time looking for x-intercepts which can be very, very important when you're looking at the economy to economists, especially back in the Middle Ages. Okay, x-intercepts, there are none. You're going to have to read how to answer this. You can type none or Probably those aren't going to be the choices that my math lab gives you. There are two different ways to write this, actually two or three or a bunch, depending on how, how you look at it. Um, that means the empty set, not zero. So from now on, try to get out of the habit of writing zero with a slash through it. Or, let's see, sometimes this, which also means the empty set. So this or this, or probably you would just choose, you know, it's a, it's a choice, and, and you would just uh, click on the button besides, no, beside the choice that says no x-intercepts.
you're going to be um, in the after spring break, we're going to be doing this a lot. You're going to get the idea. OK, now we're done with the first half of this analysis of f of x equals 7x squared minus 5x plus 5. So I suppose I really should make a line. Ta-da! Now this would have been what you were studying yesterday with a little bit extra thrown in to get you ready for the very near after spring break future. We're going to find the vertex. Now we graphed this. Oh, come on. Yeah. Here's the vertex right here. The vertex is the turnaround point. Vert is Latin for turned or turn. As in 180 degrees turn. So anytime you see any kind of word with vert in it, it probably comes from Latin and it has something to do with turning. So here's our parabola and there's the vertex because you're going down, right? This is going down. Once you get to the vertex, you start going up. If you were a little ant, you'd be having a great time sliding downhill, but now you've got a puff, 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 go uphill. And this is where that turn occurs, the vertex, also called a turning point. Well, we have to find the vertex. We're going to do it now. The vertex is so important that even though it is an XY point, all points are XY points, unless you're dealing in three dimensions like we did for about a week. But now we're back. But it is so important, that vertex, that it is often called HK. And again, from back when we did transformations, H is the horizontal shift, K is the vertical shift. Yeah, <laughs> what else do you say? Okay, now here is how we find what the vertex is. Here's the formula for the X coordinate, which is called H. H equals negative. Now we have seven X squared minus five X plus five. So A is seven, B is negative five, and C is positive five you're going to see that C doesn't really matter in this second part of the analysis. Just doesn't come into it because this formula, which is the most important formula, doesn't have C in it. It only has negative B over 2A. Cool, we can do that, that's easy. Negative, negative five over two A. 
That'll be 5 over 14. And that is what the X coordinate of the vertex is. Now we have to find K, which is the Y coordinate. This, well, you have to be grateful that we live in a time when there are calculators. K equals F of H, the H number. So it's going to equal F of 5 fourteenths, which remember is a code. It means put this number in for every X. So we're going to have seven parentheses, five fourteenths squared minus five times parentheses, five fourteenths plus five. Yes, indeed. Well, you can do it by hand if you want, but I think, yeah. I think I might let the calculator earn its keep. All right, so here's what I plan to do. I plan to just type this in here. So seven parentheses, five divided by 14, parentheses closed squared, minus five parentheses, 5 divided by 14, and then plus 5, and then enter. Ooh, not to panic, click on math, frac, enter. 115 over 28. Not really readable, is it? One, one, five. Well, how about that? One, one, five. I mean, we've seen that before, right? That was in the zeros. Um, OK, so that is our vertex. That's what this point is right there. Here it is blown up. Right there. All right, now, this que these questions are in your homework. Today's homework, like I said, is the second half. It's what we're working on now. Um, okay. Now, what about this axis of symmetry? I'll show you. Here's your parabola. And in fact, because this is one of the few times that the calculator is actually better than I am at this. I mean, you saw how some of those uh, rational functions looked on the calculator. It was horrible. All 
OK. Now I want to be able to draw. That's why it's here. Flatten. Yes. OK, now that's the vertex. We already decided on that. Okay. Well, there's an invisible line going up and down through the vertex. It's a vertical line when you're dealing with a, um, a function. And it's there, and when it's drawn very, very accurately, the parabola is evenly balanced on each side of that invisible line. That's what symmetry means, perfect balance. So, not terribly well written. Drawn right there. Now, like all vertical lines, it has an equation. Like all lines, it has an equation. And that equation is going to be x equals whatever the x coordinate is. In other words, whatever h is. <clears throat> So this is going to be x equals negative b over 2a, but we already found it. Negative b over 2a is 5 fourteenths. So here is here is the equation of the axis of symmetry. You're going to notice that once you find the vertex, you've got you've got all the work done. Now, is the vertex a minimum lowest or maximum highest point? Look at your graph. It's the very lowest point. And that will be true for all cupped up parabolas. If it's cupped up, the vertex, the turning point, is right there at the very bottom. So it's the lowest point, lowest. Lowest and minimum mean the same thing. So the vertex here in this problem is a minimum point. That's all there is to that. Now, what is the minimum value? Well, if you've got a minimum point, then you've got a minimum value. That will always be K, the K number, which is 115 over 28. K, and, and whether you've got a minimum point or a maximum point, you will have a minimum value or a maximum value, and it will always be your K. Here we've got a minimum because we've got a cupped up parabola. So the vertex occurs at the bottom of the graph.
All right, now you had to graph stuff that looked like this when we studied transformations. This is the transformation graph uh, formula for this function, 7x squared minus 5x plus 5. This can be manipulated into the following form that doesn't even look like the same thing, but it is. f of x equals a, which is 7, the leading coefficient, times x minus the h number, which is 5, 5 fourteenths? Yes, 5 fourteenths. plus k, which is 115 over 28. And this is everything that you learned. For instance, that 7 is going to be the vertical stretch. And this is going to be the horizontal shift. And this is going to be the vertical shift. This is also called vertex form. It all depends on what book you have. Vertex form or transformation form, formula. And if you work really hard on this, which will be a real pain in the butt, you can make that come out to 7x squared minus 5x plus 5. So you should do it. Do it during spring break. What else do you have to do? OK, we're being asked, what is the domain? That's our next question. State the domain. This is a parabola. All parabolas have the same exact domain. It's wonderful, whether they're cupped up or cupped down negative infinity to positive infinity, or x such that x is all real numbers. Now state the range in interval notation. I've got formulas for you here. First, you have to know, is your parabola cupped up or cupped down? Well, ours is cupped up. Therefore, the range is going to be bracket K there. And there's a reason for that. Here you've got a cupped up parabola. Here's your vertex. This is the very lowest point. At this lowest point, y equals 115 over 28. That's the very lowest. Um, did I say maximum or minimum? What is the minimum? Oh, OK. Well, minimum is. Min is. There. Notice I didn't say y equals or k equals. Don't do that. It's just a number. OK, all you have to do is look at it and say, well, obviously there is no graph down here. And the range is the y values, so this graph is going to start at 115 over 28 and then go up forever. 
So you don't really have to memorize it if you already know what range is. So that's something to think about. Just carry pictures in your head. Now, finally, we're going to talk about increasing and decreasing for the first of many times. You want to imagine a roller coaster that can only go left to right. That if you have a cupped up parabola, we would say that the function is decreasing here and increasing here. So to state the open interval on which the function is increasing, just get means give either this or this. And no, I didn't make a mistake. We look at the x-axis to say where something is happening. So state the open interval on which the function is increasing that is going up from left to right. That will be from H on the x-axis to positive infinity, whatever your H coordinate is. But notice you don't use brackets now. You do use brackets for the range here. But when you're asked about increasing and decreasing, you just don't. And there's a reason, and we will talk about it, but just not now. That's a five that got messed up. I get it. Five fourteenths. That's what H is. To infinity is where a cupped up parabola is going to be increasing. And then it says state the open interval. Now open means you use parentheses only. So parens, open interval, parens, parentheses in other words. Okay, now decreasing. Look here, here is where our cupped up parabola is decreasing. And on the x-axis, that matches up with negative infinity to h. So from negative infinity to h. And that's it. Now, you couldn't possibly have any questions about that. I'm joking. I'm going to put up a blank one of these in the week 10 module in Canvas. Um, and it will have all the formulas you need for working with quadratic functions. And all the little facts, like cupped up, cupped down, what is that? How do you find the y-intercept? All this kind of stuff. It's amazing you can get all this information just from this, if you know how to look at it. Okay, now,
Let's do it again. That helps if you do it twice. And I will attempt to speed up in order to let you know that this does not take forever. It's just that your teacher is talking, talking, talking. All right, so now we've got f of x equals negative 5x squared plus 13x minus 7. We're going to analyze that function. We're going to start with question one. Is it cupped up or cupped down? Look at the A number. The A number is negative. So this is cupped down. And looks like that with the vertex at the top. So there are things you already know. Like for instance, your vertex is gonna be a maximum point. You don't know what the vertex is yet, but it's going to be a max maximum point. Which means you'll have a maximum value, whatever your K is. You don't know what K is yet. You don't know anything about this, except that. And the fact that the y-intercept is right there at negative seven. So, the y-intercept is going to be x equals zero, y equals negative seven, that point right here. Okay, now we're gonna use the quadratic formula to find the zeros of the function. A is negative five. Didn't need to write it that far away. B is 13. And C is negative 7. All right, so X equals negative 13. Because 13 is positive, I have negative 13. Plus or minus the square root of 13 squared, which is positive, so I don't have to put it in parentheses. I usually do just from habit. Minus four times negative five times negative seven, all over two times negative five. So, come on, you get to have fun now. 13 squared minus 4, parentheses negative 5, parentheses negative 7. Make sure I did that right. Yeah, enter, 29, positive 29, negative 13 plus or minus the square root of 29. I did not attempt to take uh, the square root of it. I just found what was underneath the radical. Over negative 10. And so x equals negative 13 minus the square root of 29 over 10, negative 10. 
and x equals negative 13 plus the square root of 29 over negative 10. Okay, now, that wasn't hard at all. 29 won't break down. It's, it's a prime number, I think. Uh, yeah. So um, here's what I'm going to do next because you're not supposed to leave a negative number on the bottom of our fraction. Picky, picky, but it's true. I can move that negative up here and have negative negative 13 minus the square root of 29 over 10, where that used to be down there with 10. And then I distribute and I distribute. So I have X equals positive 13 plus the square root of 29 over 10. And then over here, x equals, I'll take that negative, bring it up here, and then copy this, negative 13 plus the square root of 29 over 10. And then distribute the negative sign so that I have x equals 13 minus the square root of 29 over 10. Those are my zeros. But first, let me point something out to you. They're real numbers, so I've got x-intercepts. Now I'm going to graph this for you. Clear. All right, we're going to have <sighs> OK. Negative five X squared plus thirteen X minus seven graph. Yep, it's a cup down parabola and it's got X intercepts here and here. Notice how easy it would be to be fooled and say, okay, one, one is one of my X intercepts. No, it's not. It's just a number that's really close to one. But you have a left x-intercept and a y-x-intercept. If you were to take the time to put these in the calculator, you would discover that this number is less than this number. Which means... This x-intercept is 13 minus the square root of 29. Well, let's just do the zeros because that's what we're being asked right now anyway. This number is located there on the x-axis. And this number 13 plus the square root of 29 over 10 is located here. The zeros are numbers on the x-axis, but the points, we'll get to that. Anyway, these are 13 plus or minus the square root of 29 over 10 those are your two zeros. 
And so I'm going to label Z1 as 13 minus the square root of 29 over 10, and Z2 as 13 plus the square root of 29 over 10. So this is Z1 and that's Z2. Now we've got to classify the zeros. They're real numbers, they're on the x-axis, but they're irrational. They're real and irrational, and there are two of them. And they are, if truth be told, conjugates. But that point is never emphasized. And I think it should be if I ruled the world, it would be. Okay. Um, now we're going to write this in factored form. Oh dear. Negative five is A. f of x equals the a number, negative 5, times x minus thirteen minus the square root of twenty nine all over ten. and x minus 13 plus the square root of 29 over 10. Notice that this is one fraction when it's written this way. This is one fraction and this is one fraction. So I don't have to do any of that distributing that I had to do with the complex numbers. So let me make this bigger so you can see it. That fraction bar acts like parentheses and groups all of this together. So I don't need a separate pair of parentheses and I don't need to distribute the minus sign. So I can say X minus the fraction 13 minus the square root of 29 over 10 and have that be in the first set of parentheses and then in the second set of parentheses X minus 13 plus the square root of 29 over 10. And this is called writing the function in factored form. Because it is, it is factored. Okay, now the x-intercepts. This, this is going to be fun. Okay, the x-intercepts are, are points, so they're written as ordered pairs. Let me make this bigger. Thirteen minus the square root of twenty-nine over 10, comma zero, and 13 plus the square roots, square root of 29 over 10, comma zero. Those are the x-intercepts. And here, is the relationship between the zeros, Z1 and Z2, and the x-intercepts when the zeros are real numbers. That is, they're in the real number system and not in the complex number system.
OK, we are done with everything based on. Yesterday's work. And everything having to do with the vertex. Is really easy and quick. That's why you you want to memorize this little formula right here. It's so short and cute. All right, the vertex is going to be HK. Wow. The vertex is HK. And H equals negative B over 2A. So it's going to equal negative 13 over 2 times negative 5, which will be negative 13 over negative 10 which quite honestly is 13 tenths or 1.3, exactly. See, it's an exact answer. So my math lab is usually, usually a little more liberal in that case. So our X coordinate is 1.3. Our K coordinate is going to be what you get when you put 1.3 in for the x's. Minus 7, OK. There you go. Negative 5 times parentheses 1.3 squared plus 13. Actually, 1.3 is positive. I don't really need parentheses, but there goes habit again. 13 parentheses 1.3 minus 7. Definitely going to use calculator. All right, so negative five times, there you go, 1.3 squared plus 13 times 1.3 minus seven. 1.45. Now, if the instructions say that you have to answer with fractions, then do answer with fractions. But these are exact answers, so I feel less worried about it. There's my vertex. The equation of the axis of symmetry is always going to be X equals the H number, which is 1.3, just always. When you're dealing with a function. Now, we have a cup down parabola. Which means the ver, excuse me, the vertex is at the very highest point. So we have a maximum point. That means we have a maximum value. That's going to be K, 1.45. See, it's as simple as that. Once you have the vertex, you have all the information you need for the whole second part of the uh, 
um, the analysis. Now, rewrite the quadratic function in vertex form. No problem, I know what A is, it's negative five. I know what H is, it's 1.3. I know what K is, 1.45. So, F of X, equals negative five times x minus 1.3 squared plus 1.45. Now the domain, all real numbers, negative infinity to positive infinity. The range, remember we start at the lowest point, well, the lowest point and go to the highest for the range. The highest Y coordinate is 1.45. So the range is going to be from negative infinity to 1.45 and a bracket because y actually equals 1.45. Okay, now increasing, decreasing. We have two minutes anyway. Increasing. Where is this sucker increasing? Well, it's cupped down like this. So here's the increasing side. So for me to tell you where it's increasing, I tell you where by coordinates on the x-axis, negative infinity up to h, where h is 1.3. And I do not use brackets, even when I really, really want to. And then decreasing is over here. So from H to H, yeah, H. H is 1.3, right? Yeah. Panicked for a minute. 1.3 to infinity. And we now have all the most, all the most, well, we have the most Im important information about this function now. All right, ladies and gentlemen. You have now entered the world of grown-up mathematicians. <coughs> mathematicians. My allergies are just terrible yesterday and today. But anyway, I'll see you tomorrow. And I'd be glad to answer your questions today. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Okay. Even though allergies are getting in the way. Say it again. Said, despite having allergies you know, getting in the way, have a good day. Yes, I will. Thank you.